Well, good morning. It is great to be with you with our Madison campus, those in the venue at Bradford. Thank you so much for joining us. If you looked at our title, you know we have a specific topic on marriage. And I want to start off with a story that many times I'll share with engaged couples. I do a lot of pre-engagement counseling. And so I don't always, but a lot of times I'll start with a story depending on where they are. I said, I want you to imagine you're going to these wedding fairs where you're picking out different things. And all of a sudden you see one that says, if you're being married on this day... And you can be in Atlanta on this day, which is the day after your wedding. You can have a free all-expense trip for your honeymoon to Hawaii. Well, that's your date. And you're thinking, well, we weren't planning to drive to Atlanta, but you, you know what? We, we could do that. And so you go and you ask information. They explain that they started a brand new resort, and they're looking for couples that will come because they want to take some pictures, and you are going to give them the right to use your photos in advertising. Also, they'd like some reviews. And they said, we're doing this as opposed to spending a lot of money on advertising. And, and so you say, great, you fill it out, thinking, is it really true? Until that week, you get a call. And they explain, yeah, are you getting married that day? Great. Can you be in Atlanta the next morning to leave out by lunch? And he said, yeah. And they go, well, great, you qualify. And you're kind of excited. You're thinking, man, we were going to Six Flags. This is going to be so much better. And so you arrive that day after your, after your marriage, and, and you're there, and it's kind of cool because you're sitting in this terminal, and there's 100 couples counting you, and all of you were married the day before. You're all going on this trip. They're doing it several times in a row, and you're kind of, this is cool. And you start talking about it, how you met, and it'll be fun. We'll get to know these people. And you're really excited until you look out the window, and you see the plane, plane landing. You know it's the plane from the resort because the resort is on the side, really big pictures of the islands in Hawaii. But you notice something. One of the engines is just sending out. Out this huge amount of black smoke thinking oh that's not good so they land and as the people are coming in there's again a hundred couples coming out and, and you start listening and most of those couples are not very happy they're talking about food poisoning about bugs about poor service about you know the hot water not working for the showers and all of a sudden you're thinking man it about only about 10 of those couples look like they're happy 90 kind of don't look happy at all so you're just sitting there looking at each other, and all of a sudden you see the two pilots step out, and, and they do something unusual. They start arguing with each other and pushing each other. And one finally pulls the microphone out of the hand of the other and said, Listen, guys, I just want to be honest. I flew this plane out. I'm off duty now. Another group is coming in. But I just want to say, you couldn't pay me enough to be on that plane. I wouldn't put my worst enemy on that plane. I don't know if it can make it. And if you're over the Pacific Ocean, you don't want it to go down. So if you go, I'm just warning you, it's on you. And he throws down the mic and he walks away. What do you do? Hey, but it's going to be a great trip. You might say, Six Flags sounds pretty good to me now. Now, why do I say that? I think you know most couples kind of get, get it as I'm talking about it. We know that 40% of all first-time marriages fail. Over 76% of all second-time marriages fail. You've heard that stat. That's when we round it to 50% of the marriages making it. But what a lot of people don't understand is Focus on the Family did a study, and they found that couples married more than 10 years, only 10% were truly happy they were married. In other words, 90% were together, but they weren't happy. And man, that's just awful. And what we're going to do this morning is, is give you some principles that if you apply in your marriage will not just help you survive. And let's be honest, two people can be stubborn and, mi and miserable together, right? Is that what you want? I'm not leaving, but I'm going to outlive you. I, I don't think that's what you want, right? But you can have some principles that will take your marriage from being frustrated to being fantastic. You can make some changes so the high point of your marriage wasn't your wedding day, but it goes up from there. So I hope by the end of this, you'll get some principles that you can apply. Now, let me just say, in this worship center, there are, you know, three groups of people. There's some of you, you aren't married. You may be young and say, my marriage is way down the line. You know, and, and others, you may have been married before and you're going, I don't know if I'm doing that again. So let me just say to you, load the principles. Put them down. Think about them. Remember them because I think they'll be helpful um, for some of you, you may just have a chance to share with others, and you can encourage them and help them from what you learn. Now, some of you, you are married, and you're so happy that you're married. You're in a marriage, it's going well, and you're like, I'm married to my best friend. This is what I always hope, and, and it's really awesome. I would just say, don't take that for granted, and learn some things to make it better, to take a tune-up, to make sure you're able to understand why you're doing things that are working, and so you can keep doing those things and not just not know why it's happening. And the third group, you know what? You're in a marriage and, you know, it's, it's not good. 
And you're thinking, Steve, I don't even know if there's hope. I don't even know what we can do to make it better. I have a pastor friend. He would say, hey, listen, I've had couples come to me, and they would say, or an individual say, my marriage is horrible. We, we can't change it. I don't know what we're going to do. And so he would look at him and say, let me just ask you a question. If you really tried, is there anything you could do in the next week to make it worse? And, of course, they'd smile and go, well, yeah, I could think of a few things. He goes, then you know what? There's some things you can do to make it better. So let's talk about those things that you can do to make it better. So wherever you are in marriage, it's my desire by the end of this time, you'll have some principles that you can apply or you can share with others that can be used in your life. Now, just a question. How can a marriage start so good and go so bad? Because I've done those weddings, and I, believe me, I don't see 50% of the people that stand before me when I'm married. I'm going, oh, man, it's not very good, but it's the best I can hope for. I, I see most couples who are, quite honestly, overly optimistic. I'm just saying. You know, and they, I don't know there's issues, but they're, but they're not. And, and so what causes it to go so bad? Well, I'll use an example. Um, me and my wife, we have a fireplace. We bought this house. I've never had a fireplace before, but it's kind of cool in the wintertime. You know, we purchased some wood, so it's there. And, you know, and we get up, I'll get up early in the morning. I'll start a pot of coffee. I'll start the fire. And so pretty soon there's a pretty good going fire. And my wife will come in, we'll enjoy coffee, and we'll sit there and talk. And then about every 15 or 20 minutes, I'll get up and I'll put another log on the fire. And as long as I do that, that fire is roaring and crackling and it's enjoyable. But you know, if I have to leave and I walk away for an hour or two hours and I come back, am I expecting to see much of a fire? No, that's right, I'm not. As a matter of fact, there may not even be embers at that point. And see, that's what happens in so many marriages. It's not some terrible thing that happens, but the things we were doing to stoke the fire, to keep the fuel, fuel on the fire going, we've stopped doing. And all of a sudden, we're doing other things. We're not, you know, like a fireplace, you've got to clean out the soot. You've got to get the embers. You've got to do all the stuff so that you have good oxygen flow to keep it going. You know, so you can have the fire that you hope that you would have. In Song of Solomon 2.15 uh, it says it's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard. And for every big time, a marriage is destroyed by adultery, addiction, abuse, abandonment. It's, it's a minority compared to the marriages that are destroyed by a lack of attention, by lack of doing what we need to do. It was early on in ministry that I learned that the majority of my counseling would be with couples struggling in marriage. Now I went through, you know, training and counseling when I was in seminary. I'd done more. I expected to talk to people a lot of times about spiritual issues. Obviously, I'm a pastor. To talk about maybe emotional issues, things from the past. But I found again and again, it was couples coming in that were greatly frustrated. Some of them on the edge of going, we don't know if we can even stay together. Uh, so, you know, I did my best to learn. I took classes. I got certified in different things. I, I was looking just this week just to see, looking at books I have in my office and at home, and I have over 100 books marriage, on marriage that I've read. Majority, mo the mass majority are Christian marriages that I've learned principles from. And so I was trying to apply these things. And it was kind of like, here's a principle, here's a principle, here's a principle. And someone would come in, I think, okay, can they try this? Can they try, try this? Well, that didn't work with the last couple. I think I'll try this. And it was like putting things together. And many times it was like duct tape, trying to hold things together. And, the, and it just wasn't working the way it did. And, you know, I kind of... You know, remember that, you know, that so, so many couples, when they come in, they're already so stressed. I mean, the average couple is in stress for six years before they go and talk to someone about improving their marriage, fixing the issue. Six years. Can you imagine there's a leak on your roof? You look at your, uh, at your sheetrock, it starts to discover, and you realize the rain's coming. Would you look at your spouse and say, you know what, in the next five or six years, we probably want to deal with that. No, pretty soon the roof would crash in. Or if you found a tumor under your leg and you felt the bump there and you felt the tumor is getting bigger and bigger, would you say, you know what, probably the next five or six years I want to go to the doctor. No, you would go immediately. Why? Because you see how important it is. And we need to not wait. So if there's issues, we want to learn so we can apply them into it. Now I want to give you a little bit of backstory. We'll help you understand this message. So I'm working my best. I'm, I'm trying to learn. I'm having some success, some frustration. And I'm just a pastor. I'm reading through. I'm doing study in Revelation. And I come across a section in Revelation chapter 2 where Christ is, is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the church of Ephesus. And all of a sudden I read this and I go, oh my goodness. He talks about them losing their first love. And I go, wait a minute. These are the principles that can apply in a marriage. 
Which makes sense because metaphorically, Christ is the groom and we are the bride. And so the idea of things we can learn as a bride and as a groom to connect, it makes sense. And all of a sudden, it kind of hit me. I saw three major rails, three major tracks. And all of a sudden, this stuff I'd read in this book fit here. And this stuff read in this book fit here. And this stuff in this book fit here. And pretty soon, I could pretty much capitalize all the principles addressing these three major things. So then I started using that with couples. When they would come in, we would cover all three, but we might focus on this one or that one. And all of a sudden, I started seeing change happen. I started seeing couples going from frustration to excited, excitement in their marriage. And all of a sudden I understood that they could apply things that would make a difference in their marriage. See, they're not just instructions to save your marriage from divorce. Remember, two stubborn people can decide to stay miserable. I'm talking about getting back to the place where you want to be. Where this person is your favorite person. Where you just can't wait to see them. And if you see them walking down the hall towards you, your pulse just kind of goes up a beat. See, it's possible to return to that place you were. Now, let me tell you, the truth is, it's not like flipping a switch. It's not, I'm going to give you these three principles, boom, you're going to walk out, and man, your marriage, it's, it's incredible, everything's changed. No, it's more like learning the principles that once consistently apply make a difference. Let, let's say, for instance, you want to get in shape, and I know rounds of shape, but let's say you want to get in a better shape, and you think, how can I do this? So you're working all this stuff on Marathon. You come across this picture. It's this really big guy. And a picture of him is he's a skinny guy. He said, I lost 50 pounds and ran a marathon six months later. And you're going, whoa, that, that's a pretty big change. That before picture kind of looks like me. And so you watch his video. He tells the story of how he wanted to get in shape and he wanted to do this. And he didn't like lifting weights, so he decided to run a marathon. And, and you start watching and he got, kind of goes, you know, as they do the time lapse and that six or seven minutes to show what he was doing and it's all this stuff. And you're like, wow, that was incredible. And you think, you know what, that, that could be me. I could run that marathon. I, I, I could, this could be what I use. And then you realize he sells these principles in a great little down loan for $29.95. So you buy them. And they really are good. It's good principles. It's good stuff. Now, once you did that, will you be able to walk out the next day and run a marathon? Uh-uh, you aren't. But if you do what he says, if you follow that plan, you know what you'll find out? Six months from now, you'll be able to run a marathon. And you may not have lost 50 pounds. You may have lost less or even more. But you know what? You'll be different because of what you're applying. And that's what I want to say today. The principles you get are not like flipping a switch, but they are principles that if you start applying and you regularly put them into practice in your marriage, where you can be six months from now is incredible compared to where you are today. So let me read that passage. It's in your notes. This is from Revelation 2, 4, and 5 that gave me that epiphany as I was going through it. Uh, it's, a, it's a New American Standard Version because that was what I was studying back then when I did that. It says, but I have this against you. This is Christ speaking to the church of Ephesus, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. So I want you to, to circle, if you're using notes, circle the word remember. That's one principle. Circle the word repent. That's another principle. And then circle the word do, or it literally means to do again. Now, just so you know, to do again means to redo. And guess what? There is nothing more exciting for a pastor than to have a sermon that has three points that all start with the same letter. So we got it. It's going to be remember, repent, and redo. Now, listen, I wish I could put as much time into this as I could. But, you know, the reason why, if you noticed in your bulletin, there's a seminar my, my wife Lonnie and I are doing uh, really two Saturdays from this coming, it's coming up. It's going to be July 29th. In that, we're going to spend a lot of time with each one of these. We're going to give you exercises and, and practical things you can do there. And we're going to give you a take-home plan that you can put in practice, kind of like how to run a marathon, that if you can start practice, it will make a huge difference. So I would just say, don't wait. If Maybe that's something you want to attend, something that could help you, but I promise you what you get today will be actionable. So let's do, let's look at what we can learn and how we can apply these things. The, the first principle, the first principle is remember. Remember, as I just said. Now let me say this. As you're going through this, I want to say that I see husbands and wives sitting next to each other. Can I encourage you, please don't do any elbow amens. You know what that is? I say a point and you think, oh God, I know who, I know you want to speak to my spouse. And you go, mm, mm, mm. You know, you just kind of hit it there. Or maybe you're just taking notes and you circle it. You put a star on it. You kind of scoot it over. Did, did you get that? That was, that was pretty good. I like that, you know. 
But don't worry, ladies, you know, uh, we'll do the same thing. Yeah, this is the one. This is it. Don't do that. Remember James said, don't just be a hearer of the word and so become self-deceived. The moment you start listening for someone else, I promise you, you have stopped listening for yourself. So you say, God, hear my, speak to me. God, you're not your spouse's parent. You're not your spouse's Holy Spirit. Let God speak to them. You say, God, speak to me, and he can speak to you. So the first thing he says, remember, remember, he says to him, remember from where you have fallen. Again, he's talking to the church. And some of you may say, Steve, I don't, I don't need a marriage service. Well, just apply this to your spiritual life. Because some of you have drifted from your relationship with God. And these principles apply right there to how you get back. Remember from where you have fallen. Because the drift that happens in a marriage happens slowly over time, most couples don't realize how far they've drifted from each other And they're shocked one day when they look up and they go, oh my goodness, look how far apart we are. See, as time has went, you know, we went from going overlooking faults to focusing on the bad stuff. We went from developing a strong relationship to being kind of more judgmental in our relationship. And this has caused a negativity bias to happen over time. And you got to first just recognize how far you drifted. Just think how happy you were, how excited you were to see each other, how happy you were in your wedding day and say, is that still here now? When I was in high school, I liked um, at skin diving. I had a snorkel mask and fins, and I would go down to Florida. And when I did, I enjoyed doing that. And one time I went down with a friend. We were there. I was in high school, and I went out as I normally did. And I was just going along the the ocean, just kind of looking at different things. And I really wasn't paying attention. And I probably went 40, 50 minutes. And all of a sudden, I looked up, not realizing there was a bit of a riptide that I wasn't paying attention to. And so when I looked out of the water to see, orient myself to where the hotel, hotel was, I realized I was way, way out. I thought, okay, well, just cool down. Just take it easy. Just start swimming. And all of a sudden, that's when I noticed the riptide. That's when I noticed as I was trying to go in, it was pushing back. So I remember what I'd learned. Don't go against it. Go at an angle towards beach. Look for it. And I did. And it took me three hours to get back in. And I was exhausted. There were times I was looking for boats, anything. And I remember getting to that beach, and I remember coming out, and people just looking at me because I was like, I was praising the Lord. And I dove down, and I touched that sand. I was like, thank you, because I realized, wow, how quickly I did. And here's the thing. You can drift apart so much quicker than you think. And when's the last time you just looked at your marriage and saying, is this what we want it to be? If we keep going the way we go, is this going to take us where we want to be? Because see what happens when you don't deal with it, your marriage will have this what's called, I call it a negativity bias. So when you first are dating and engaged, you have all these positives, all the things. I like this, I like this, I like this. And you have a few negatives. So imagine a scale where the positive is so incredible that if something negative happens, you don't even think about it. It's so small, it's so little. But then over time, we stop focusing on the positives and we start focusing on the negatives. And it's almost imperceivable because it's still a flip. But somewhere along the way, that thing hits the scale, and all of a sudden we shift to a negative bias. At that point, when something happens, we assume the worst, not the best. At that point, we tend to c- c- negative. Now, if you catch it early, that's great, and hopefully maybe some of you will. It doesn't take much to focus on the positive and flip it back. But if you've been in that for years and years and years, it's hard to do it. I mean, you can do it, but it takes a lot of doing the right thing without seeing a result all at once. And see, when you have a negativity bias, you start having what I call expectancy theory. When you see the negative, you start looking and you start experiencing, you start seeing more negative. I mean, just imagine you're going to buy a new car and you think, ah, I love Honda Accords. Those are great cars. I think I want to go buy one or look at one. So you go to the Honda dealership, you get in the car, you drive around town with your spouse, you're enjoying it, you put it back and you go, hey, listen, we're going to think about it. We'll get back with you. And Monday, you're driving to work and as you're driving to work, guess what you notice all around you. Honda Accords. Now, did the Honda dealership pay someone to start following you? Is it kind of like the government? Okay, I'm turning here. Get behind him. You know, no, it's not. Because you saw it, you're more aware of it. As you're more aware of it, you see it more. And see, that's the, that's the terrible side of a negativity bias. It colors everything we see. Our first point here, a positivity or a negativity bias will color, color how you see the past the present, and the future. It will color how you see the past, the present, and the future. This is a technique used in counseling to do an analysis of a marriage. If I sit down with a couple and talk to them, I can just ask them about the past, 
And that will give me a picture of how they're doing because you can see the biases. So I'm like, hey, tell me when you were dating. She goes, huh, should have never accepted that date. That's a sign, you know, just so you know. You know. <laughs> if I'm like, you know, how did he engage? Ah, well, I'll tell you what, it's like the worst one I've seen, you know. Or if you're talking to the marriage, I mean, if the guy, you're asking this, well, yeah, she doesn't. And all of a sudden you start realizing everything they're seeing in the, the past, it's like there was nothing good. And I can promise you there were good things. I've done over 200 weddings, and I've yet had the couple stand before me that was not ecstatic and happy and excited about what they were doing. I've never seen, in my, in my experience, I know it can happen, but I've never had a reluctant spouse. If anything, I say, whoa, whoa, wait, we don't go out yet. Wait, wait. I mean, it's there. But you see that. And see, when you have the negativity bias, it also affects your present. So when something happens, you call your spouse, and they don't answer, and negativity bias, ah, oh, they ghosted me. I can't believe that. I, why didn't they take my call? They just don't want to talk to me. But if you have a positive device and they miss, the, oh, they, 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 they aren't here. They'll call me back. See the difference it makes? And here's the worst thing. It takes away all the hope for the future. Because you just anticipate things are going to get bad and they're only going to get worse. So having that bias as a positivity bias is so important. Next point, it's not what happens to you, but what happens in you that matters. It's not what happens to you, but it's what happens in you that matters. See, an event can happen in a few moments, and it's not that event, but your fixation on the event that really affects its impact. It's been said before, it's not what someone says to you, it's what you say to yourself after they quit talking. You have that argument with your spouse, and you're thinking, they think I'm an idiot, they think I'm dumb. I and you go, let's, let's say, for instance, let's say me and Lonnie, I'm getting ready to go to work, i got to meet someone early, so I'm leaving, and we spin up, we get into a small fight, and we leave. Now, let's just be honest, we know it's my fault, but that's fine. I, so I'm driving to work. You know, and I'm thinking about that, but also I'm, re, I'm kind of replaying this. So wait a minute, she didn't say this. And, you know, she didn't recognize, you know, and I'm starting to, you know, think about it. And then I come back to work, and for the rest of the afternoon, I'm thinking about, well, I would have said this. I should have said it. And, you know, I think about the, the fight maybe 20, 30 times. When I'm on my way home, how well is it going to go when I get home? Not good. See, at least if I said, you know what, that's... You know, I, I'm not going to think about it now because there's no reason to. I can't change it. So when it pops in my mind, I'm going, nope, nope, I'll think about it later. There's no reason to think about it now. At least then I would come home no more negative than I was when I got there. Or I could have a positivity bias and say, you know, that's so unlike Lonnie. You know, I mean, she said that sharply. Well, did she or was, was I kind of maybe in a hurry to get in and I cut her off? And, and so what can happen is I actually can come home having kind of reinterpreted it, so I'm like, hey, it wasn't a big deal, and guess what? Can we deal with it then? It's momentum. We can knock it right down. See, it's not what happens, you know, to you. It's what happens in you that really matters. Paul gives us a great example of this in Philippians. Remember in Philippians, he's talking to the church, and the church at Philippi is, has a division, two groups that are kind of becoming sideways with each other, and he's trying to address the issues that are there. And he says this, which applies to the church, but it definitely applies in marriage, Philippians 4, 8, in your notes. He says, and now, brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You get that? The word fix, it's like put, a, put blinders on. Just look at these things. In other words, the negative things may be out here, and you're not denying reality, but you're going, no, no, there are positives I'm looking at. I'm thinking, you know, I can fix my thought if it's true. Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it, those are things I want to focus on because those things allow me to see the positives that help create a positivity bias within the relationship with my spouse. Now, if you come to our seminar, we'll give you lots of application and stuff. Let me give you one that you can do tonight. All right? If you have an Apple uh, iPhone or if you have an Android and you have a note program, you can open a note program and you can just say, things I love about my spouse. And when you get home sometime tonight before you go to bed, think of one thing you love about your spouse, something endearing to you. Maybe it's something they did for you. Maybe it's something you like about them. But write down one thing, then close the app. Then the next night when you get home, that evening before you go to bed, open the app. Read that thing and think about it. I mean, sit in it for a minute. I mean, I love the way when they look at me and just smile. Or I love when they think about it. And then add a second thing. And then guess what you do the third day? You read those two and you look for a third one. I have a Google Doc that has over 50 things I love about Lonnie. And can I tell you, I can't read those things without this kind of smile coming to my face. Now, if I had a doc, 50 things that really tick me off about Lonnie, 
and I read that every night, how well would it go? Not well. See, you can glance at those issues you have to deal with, focus on what is good, what is right, what is honorable, and you do that over time, I can promise you it can make a great change. Next principle, repent. Repent. That Greek word means to change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude. Change one's way of thought. It's a complete change of thought and attitude. Our next point, the most important predictor of marriage, longevity, and happiness is not the absence of conflict, but the method in which conflict is addressed. See, we sometimes have a wrong thought that if you have a great marriage, you'll never fight. You'll never have conflict. You fight, but you know, that's not true. A matter of fact, conflict is the price you pay for a greater level of intimacy in a marriage. I have engaged couples who think, oh, we'll never fight. I'm going, yeah, okay, that's fine. We'll set an uh, appointment follow-up three months after you get married. I love this. It'll be great. See, when one sinner marries another sinner and you start having sinnerettes, I'm just saying, it, it's going to happen. So it's not will you fight, what will you do with it? And see, if you fight all the time, you'll destroy your marriage. You know, and you'll, you'll end up suffering incredible, both emotionally and physically, in your own self. Now, some say, well, I, we have a solution, Steve. We never fight about anything. We just don't talk about it. If it's negative, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. And that would be kind of like taking the garbage out of your house and putting it in the can by your house, but never taking that garbage to the street. Now, imagine doing that for about three months or six months or a year. And the side of your house is nothing but this mound of garbage with flies and rats and raccoons. It wouldn't be very nice, would it? And see, if you keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing and you never deal with the issues, you can't improve the relationship. And guess what? There are some things that if you deal with once, you can figure it out and put it behind you forever. One study said, study showed that 41% of everything you fight over, if you get to the point and you clarify it and you clear it, you can take it off so you never worry about it again. Bad news, 61% of the things, they never go away. It's the dance of learning to live together with another sinner and having the issues that are there. But we have the strength to go through that. Now, of all the books I read on conflict and, and marriage, probably the one that stood out the most on understanding conflict was one by Dr. John Gottman. Actually, several he's written. Um, he's Jewish. But the principles he shares really have a biblical basis. I can give you biblical points under each one of them. And he did something unique. He had a study in which they set up what's called a love lab. And they had couples come in. Where they would come in a Friday and stay through a Sunday, and they knew they were being watched, they were being monitored, and he watched their fights. And his grad students recorded the fights, he would watch them, he would, he'd sit and he'd talk to them. And then here was the study. He had to predict after one weekend, one conversation, five years from now, would this couple be married or divorced? It'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? Do you know he had a 91% accuracy by watching their conflict? Because nothing is a greater determinant of your happiness and your ability, longevity of a marriage than how you conflict. He came up there with a thing he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it's criticism, defensiveness, contempt, stonewalling. You almost take it like steps you were going down. And he knew the farther each couple went down those four steps, the more destructive and the less likely they could turn around and deal with issues. He noticed something um, called, uh, you know, something that, that happened within couples when they argued, and that was called flooding. L look at the next point. Over time, unhealthy conflict will degrade the health and happiness of a marriage. Notice I use the words unhealthy conflict, because there is such a thing as healthy conflict. You have to learn to fight well, to fight fair. And I use the word fight, but it's really conflict. There needs to be a way in a marriage that you can point out, hey, listen, here's something that is, that, that is affecting our marriage, because sometimes your spouse can go, oh, well, I can change that. There, there needs to be ways in which you can address these issues. And, and if you don't delve into them, they can never get better. But what happens if we aren't careful? We get into a, a conflict and this thing happens called flooding. Flooding is when you get uh, raised physiologically. And all of a sudden you kind of get upset and your adrenaline releases. What do we know? Adrenaline is there to fight, flight, or freeze. None of those are good in a conflict. And so it comes in and all of a sudden you're, you're 
your blood pressure will go up, your pulse rate will go up. Without even realizing, you start to flood. And I can tell you, when you're flooding, nothing good can happen. You'll say things you don't mean. You'll over-exaggerate things. You'll say things you wish that you never said that will cause great damage to them. I don't use it much, but I have some monitors in my office. And occasionally I'll use it. It's a little finger monitor. I can set an alarm. And if somebody goes over whatever I set, normally it's 124 beats, a little alarm goes off. And couples that really are dealing with it, I will put that on at times, and they are shocked when all of a sudden their alarms start going off. They have no perception that their pulse rate is that high. But if you don't realize it, once you get in that point, the negativity that can happen in the marriage, the destruction you can do in a moment of flooding is more than you can imagine. That's why Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer def- deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. See, just understanding, we want to be gentle in how we respond. We don't want, we, we want to deflect the anger. And there are some times we just have to realize, you know what, this is not a good time. This is not a healthy time to communicate. The next principle, defensiveness demonstrates that you've quit listening and you're putting walls between yourself and your spouse. See, when you become defensive, you show, you, you've, you, you have, you stop listening and you start putting up walls. See, the moment we become defensive, we kind of get in that argument where we're trying to defend ourselves rather than deal with the issue. So if Lonnie is saying something to me, and I'll, whoa, whoa, that's not right. She says, like, you never take trash out. And my mind goes, wait a minute, three weeks ago on Thursday, I took the trash out. No, that's wrong, you know. And I want to jump in right now. No, 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 no. I mean, and, and you see this, and all of a sudden the argument happens. In the moment that I get defensive mentally, I no longer listen to her. It's just ba 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 until finally I can jump in. Listen, I grew up at home. I had three older sisters. I was the only boy. And I strategically learned when we were at dinner, I could wait for them to breathe and jump in real quickly and say something. So I'm really good at jumping in just at a moment of pause. And here's the problem. I will do that with Lonnie at times in which she has not finished speaking. Is there anything more frustrated than being speaking and someone jumps in and cuts you off? Ah, there isn't. And I do it. I'm bad to do that. So I've had to learn mentally to count. And when Lonnie quits speaking, I'm not great at it. But many times I'll sit there and think, a thousand one, a thousand two, a thousand three, a thousand four. And here's the thing. I can't tell you the number of times I get mentally to a thousand two and, and she starts speaking again. I thought it was a period. It was a comma. I didn't know that. And if you jump in when it's a, it's a comma and it's a period, you're going to frustrate that person. And I'm very good at doing that. So I have to wait. See, there's a value in just being heard. I have a friend who's a professional counselor. He charges $180 an hour. And he tells me 90% of what he gets paid to do is just listen and be a friend. To give them undivided attention, not to cut them off, to reflect what they're saying and let them know they've been heard and understood. He goes, I'm not using my professional therapy. My case. He charges $180, $180 a session, and he has a waiting list of weeks for people to talk to him. Guys, I'm going to let you know. I'll do it for $100 an hour. We can talk later. But, <laughs> I'm, but isn't it amazing? And think about your spouse. They just want to feel like you've heard them. You listen, and if you wait, then you can say, okay, you're saying this rather than talking through them or over them. James 1.19, what a great verse. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Guys, that first one, man, it, you know, it's, it's terrible. I'm, I'm, I can, sometimes I'm not quick to listen, and I'm definitely at times not slow to speak. But here's what I found out. When I'm quick to listen and slow to speak, I am slow to become angry. It's amazing how that third one kind of happens as a result. So again, we want to demonstrate that we're listening. The next point, when you engage in destructive conflict, contempt for your spouse will grow over time and eventually take over your marriage. This is a place most people never expect to get to, a place of contempt, that's in, in, in Gottman's study, he would say the couples that got to contempt very rarely get back to a healthy marriage. They would either stay mir- miserable or end up divorcing, he said. But that was a turning point. Because here's what happens. At the moment of contempt, I start thinking I have a mental superiority over my spouse. Or not mental, just superiority. In other words, moral superiority. I'm thinking, you know what, I'm right. I'm a good spouse, you're not. I work hard in the marriage, you don't. 
I try and you don't. I do this with the family, and all of a sudden, we're no longer looking at what we should do or our part. All we're doing is looking at them. And then we start really, at a point, start seeing them in contempt. We start seeing them as lesser. We start doing, and it's amazing at that point how much destructive can, destruction can happen in a marriage. Hitler, during Germany pre-World War II, got the Germans to hold the Jews in, dis, in contempt. Think about it. He, he got them to feel like they're the problem, they're the issues, that's all the suffering. So it made sense. We can wear a star because we need to know who these Jews are because they're stirring things up. They can put a star on their business because after all, if I have two bakers, one has a star, he's Jewish, and one, I don't want to go to the one that's not Jew because I don't want to support them. They're destroying our country. And then pretty soon when they were rounded up, when they were shipped off on trains, it was like, well, you know what? It's better for Germany if they're not here. See, that's what contempt does. When you become contempt in, in a marriage, you get to that point, it's like you can see no good thing. And you don't even mean to, but you may not realize you become like a Pharisee. You're the one sitting in the seat of judgment. No longer are you asking God, what do I need to change? What needs to be different in me? You're just looking at them and going, you know what? They have a problem. They have an issue. Our problem in our marriage is them. And you may say I'm some wrong, but they're the majority wrong. Ephesians 4.29 See, I say this because, before I read the verse, you know, contempt is like cancer in a marriage. Once you let it in, you'd be shocked at what it can lead you to do. You'd be shocked at what you'll say, at the harsh things that will happen. That's why I don't let it throw you off what Paul's talking to Christians here, and he says, don't use foul or abusive language. Now, hold on for a minute. You think, Steve, I would never do that with my spouse. Yes, you would. I've been there. I've been with couples who have you know why? Because once you let contempt happen, it comes in. It's so destructive. But he says this, let everything you say be good, helpful, so that the words will be encouraging to those who hear them. See, there's sometimes you just kind of need that theology of thumper. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. There's times when it's better just to be quiet. But we have to understand. Now, here's the good news. Contempt and appreciation cannot coexist. So when you build a culture of appreciation, you can't go into contempt. That's why having that list of things you appreciate about your spouse is so important. That's why reading that list every day by reminding yourself every day that you want to build a culture of appreciation. Because I can promise only when that appreciation goes away can you start heading towards contempt. It's one of the best inoculations that will protect you. Next point. Just as you would respond immediately to a fire alarm, you must learn to take swift action to shut down destructive conflicts and re-engage later. Remember I talked about flooding and once you're flooded, no good thing's going to happen. And when you're in a relationship and you're in a fight and you're in an argument and all of a sudden you realize either you or your spouse, you can recognize it and you can just, wow, we're, we're, we're at this high level. The best thing you can do is say, you know, we got to stop. We got to stop. You know, we'll come back to this. It's not we'll never talk. We'll come back to this in an hour. Let's take a walk. Or you know what? We're, let's wait till tomorrow and talk about it. this. is spinning out of control. I love you. I don't want to feel these things. I don't want to say these things. So you have to be willing to disengage so you can engage in a healthy way later. You know, there's some couples I work with, and it is so bad, they're not allowed to have any discussions about their marriage when, unless they're sitting down with me. And every week when they sit down, we have a fight. And for an hour, man, they're going at it, and I'm throwing a flag here and a yellow flag here, and I'm rocking, you know, giving you 15 yards this way. I mean, why? Because they've got to this point where they cannot even trust themselves without going there. They have to learn to re-engage in a healthy way. See, we have to speak the truth in love. This means not just the right words, but the right time. The good news is you can break the bad habits and learn to share complaints in the marriage in a healthy way. One that allows you to deal with the issues, deal with the frustration that you can have in marriage in a healthy manner. In a way that improves the marriage and solves the problem. You know, the, the verse there I have in Ephesians 4.15. Instead, you know, instead of using that, that abusive language, instead of those things, instead we will speak the truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. See, we want to speak truth, but I can tell you it's so important that you not just speak truth, but that you speak it at the right, right time. When a person is ready to hear it, 
when it's the time in which they'll be open to hearing what you say. And there's sometimes it's not there. And at those times, nothing good will happen by entering into a conflict. So learning, which is a big part of what we talk about, learning to develop healthy conflict is huge. And many of us, we didn't learn. We saw our parents. They did it right or they didn't. But we didn't learn. We fell into patterns. The bad news is they're patterns. The good news, patterns are breakable. You can change them. Our last R, our last thing, redo. Redo, as he said, do again what you did at first. We all start out wanting to meet each other's needs in a marriage. If we didn't, guess what? You wouldn't have got married. If you were a jerk when you were dating, she wouldn't have married you. If you were a jerk at when, he was da- when you were married, he wouldn't have married you. You were caring for each other. You were meeting one another's needs. But at some point, one or both of you stopped giving and started taking. One of the most valuable principles I teach when I'm teaching young couples, because it's very easy to understand, it's, it's very applicable, is that of the love bank. In the book, His Needs, Her Needs, it's a book in there. And it seems a really interesting principle, but it's so easy to do. Is that basically, every time you do something that your spouse appreciates, you say a kind word, you maybe help unload the dishes they didn't ask, whatever steps you take, units go in this bank. And wherever these units are, it's kind of how you feel in the moment. So as you do these things that mean something to your spouse, units go in, which is awesome. But guess what? When you do something that ticks your spouse off, when you do something they don't like, when you're rude, when you're insensitive, guess what? Units come out. And here's something I learned. I can take those units out so much faster than I put them in. It's amazing. It's like a bank, it's like a checking balance. You know, it goes down a lot quicker than it goes up. Now, it's very important to understand this because here's something amazing that I found. That if your units are like three quarters or higher, in other words, your marriage is basically going good. You have that positivity bias. And your spouse thinks about you and you aren't around. Guess what happens? Units go in the bank. You didn't even do anything. See, that's why you're dating or engaged. It's so nice. It's like it's, you left them, and it's like they're more happy that when you saw them than when you left them. Why? Because of the positivity bias. And because what's happening is you just assume the best, and more and more stuff is going in. But guess what? There's a bad side of that. If those units get less than a quarter, and you think of your spouse, guess what happens? Units come out, and you didn't even do anything. See, that's why it's so vital that you keep the love bank filled. Because if you don't, you put yourself in a place in which you're behind the eight ball automatically. See, the, uh, when we teach this session in our seminar, this is the one session we divide the men and women purposely. I'm going to speak to the guys. Talk about the needs your wife has and how to meet them. And I'm going to do it when your wife isn't going to hear me say that. So they're not going to take great notes for you and take it yourself. And if I teach you four things and you only do one, she's going to go, wow, you never did that before. She's not going to go, that's three things you, that you're not doing. And guess what? Lonnie's going to take the ladies, and she's going to talk about meeting the needs of your husband and how you do that so that we can, uh, we can apply those things in something and learn to meet our spouse's need. Last point. If you want to have a lasting love, you must understand and choose to meet your spouse's greatest needs. This is the important part. As a gift, circle that word, not in exchange. Circle that world. See, this is... This is a godly thing. This is a Christian thing. This is why marriages that are centered on Christ can be so much different than those that aren't. Because in the world we live in, they don't give love, they exchange love. In the world we're in, they say, I'll love you as you love me. I'll love you as much as you love me. I'll love you as long as you love me. But at some point, when one person stops giving, you know what happens? The other person stops. And it becomes a vicious cycle waiting for the other to do it. But see, in a relationship that pleases God, it's not an exchange, it's a gift. See, Christmas has messed us up because we really don't give gifts. We exchange gifts, right? We're going to buy a gift for everybody, $25 limit. And you better do that for every 25 bucks. Not on sale at $10, retail on $25. You know, it's, it's exchange. But if you're driving down the road and you see a homeless guy there and you feel for him and you gave him a $20 bill here, I hope this helps. Are you going to drive by next week and say, hey, man, I gave you that $20. Are you getting it back for me yet? No, we laugh. Why? Because it's, it's a gift. It's not an exchange. And yet in marriages, so many times, we aren't really giving, we're exchanging. And exchange works for a while, but it won't continue to work because at some point, someone gets tired. At some point, some person stops giving. And at that point, if it becomes reciprocal, if it's quid pro quo, your marriage is going to go south really quick. Look at the last verse. Don't be selfish. 
Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out for your for your look out only for your own interest, but take in the interest of others too. See, we need to understand the principle of the love bank so we use it in the right way to meet needs. That is why having Christ as the center of your marriage makes such a big difference. Because see, two individuals, when they're empowered by God, when I get my worth, when I get my acceptance from God, when I get my purpose from God, you know what? I have a surplus to give to Lonnie. But if I'm somehow thinking she's the, she's the person who make me feel good, she's the person who I want to feel impressed, if all of a sudden I'm putting that on her, she can't handle that, and neither can I for her. But when I'm getting it from God, I have a surplus to give. I'm able to meet her needs because God has first met my needs. And listen, I don't meet Lonnie's needs as she has met my needs. I do it because I'm called to do it. So for some reason, she stops meeting my needs. It doesn't affect me meeting hers. In other words, we use meeting one of those needs as a carrot and a stick. When they do good, we give them the carrot. Hey, baby, good job, good job. And they do bad, we give them a stick. Nope, nope, nope. That's conditional love. See, we can understand as we give, we make room for God to work in a Christian marriage. I'm not Lonnie's Holy Spirit. I'm not her dad. I am her husband, and I'm to love her unconditionally as God loves me. It doesn't mean there's not, again, negatives can happen. You deal with in a marriage. But in the small things of life, we focus on loving and caring for each other. Listen, I don't know where you are in your relationship today, but I can promise Where you are today is not where you have to be. You don't have to settle. In a week, a month, uh, six months, a year, you can be in a totally different relationship than you're in today. One unless you're like, wow, I never even knew it could be this good. Where you're married to your best friend, where you can't wait to be with them, and your marriage is not a chore, but it's a joy, and it reminds you of those early days where you couldn't wait to be with each other. These steps are simple, but they're not easy. And the longer that you've let your marriage drift away, the longer it will honestly take to get back. It just makes sense. But if you do the right thing, you move in the right direction long enough, it will change the trajectory of your marriage. Listen, one of the reasons we're doing the seminar in just a few weeks is because we know you need more than one message one time. You need it. You need to be able to unpack the principles and apply them. And also, I want to say, you can use this as an evangelistic event because there's some people, if you invite them to church, they'd never come. But you know what? They're struggling in their marriage. And if you offer them a chance in which they can come in and find hope, they can find fulfillment, they might come. And that might be the first step that God takes and directing them and connecting them to do it. So do that. Reach out to others. You might be surprised how God uses that. But I want to say to you today, if you're here today, are you willing to remember? Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to redo? Because if you are willing to put in the price and to to pay the price for it, these things make a difference. Just as Christ spoke to the church and says, here's how you come back to your first love for me, it's how you can come back for your first love for one another. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for loving us. And God, I know in a, in a group this size, uh, this message hits on so many different ears. And yet I know you can speak to each one. Maybe, maybe all you're going to speak to is their relationship with you. Because God, as I'm talking about marriage, all they've thought about is how much they've drifted from you as their Savior. And they need to apply these steps in their spiritual life to engage back with you. Maybe there's someone here today who's never received you as Savior, and they realize in their relationships they've tried to been doing it all on their own, and they need you to be the reserve, to be the power that allows them to live the life that you've called them to live, to love their spouse in the way that you love them. Or, or God, maybe there's ones today, and, and quite honestly, this is a tough day because they aren't happy in their marriage. They aren't happy in what's going on, and I pray for them they would have hope. Not what is, but what can be. That you would infuse them with hope, knowing that you've laid out these principles because they do make a difference. Father God, we thank you for this time. Now help us obey. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.